I want to talk with all three of you a little bit about technique. Now, everybody um, has their own little quirky system. It might be a certain kind of software. It might be a ritual that you use for writing. What, Susan, what's your, what's your secret sauce in, in how you get this done? I have no technique. <laughs> I, well, basic, uh, for me, it was all structure. I mean, I would have to, you know, first of all, I had a, uh, I, had, I had a researcher on, I hired a researcher for 11 of the 12 years that I worked on the book because I'm not a, um, an academic, you know, a, a trained historian. And, uh, Could have I, fooled me. <laughs> thank you. But she, <coughs> she contributed a great deal in finding documents that I would have never known how to find. And helping me keep, so that was my system. I'll, okay, I'll tell you. So I would uh, read, you know, hundreds of books, and I would mark them, and and uh, uh, I, I either my researcher or other uh, people that I hired part time would scan and 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 I would put them in categories, um, uh, and so every chapter had, you know, maybe thirty or forty small categories of 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 the survivor, the, the primary survivor stories, the main characters, and then all of the other, um, care, all of the other hundreds of survivors who may have, some, uh, they're not named, but their stories are woven into the, the narrative, the, the U.S. perspectives, the Japanese perspectives, the medical perspectives, the, the um, social and psychological, the rebuilding of the city, the, all of these different things, um, and I would, I would just. Um, so I would, I would read the major sources and all the minor sources. I would kind of divide it up, and then I'd have that. I'd have to read again and decide what's the story and how to do it. And then I'd have to decide, well, what's the structure? What goes first, and how are they all interrelated? Uh, the level of inter, you know, trying to find how to write a na that narrative for me was the greatest challenge. And my editor, Melanie Tortorelli, is sitting here, and she... Um, had a great deal to do with some, in particular, some cer certain chapters, helping me restructure in a way that would, that would hold the story well, uh, hold all those components well. Because there's the personal narrative, and then there's the, the exposition that is needed to flesh out. Um, uh, like you were saying, 12, five people can't tell the story of uh, post-nuclear survival. Nick, where? You need to speak to my ghostwriters. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, it, I, I was tempted at the beginning, kind of, it would have made my life easier if I'd structured it thematically. That would have been possible. So, you know, a chapter on mm -hmm. labor, a chapter on time, a chapter on prisoner relations, and so on, uh, perpetrators. That would have made it easier to write, mm -hmm. in a way. But it wouldn't have worked, because as I tried to say before, these concentration camps, even though they existed only for a very short period of time, were incredibly dynamic. I mean, the Nazis first invent the camp system when they come to power, and, and then reinvent it again and again and again. So, in a, you can only tell that story kind of in a in a chronologically driven narrative, and that made it then much more difficult to feed these different themes in without repeating myself mm -hmm. all the time. What really helped me was also structure, and I decided then a few years in, um, on a very uh, um, strict structure, which I had to conform to in a way. There was a um, film movement in, in the Scandinavian countries, in Denmark, uh, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, called Dogma. I'm not sure if you can, if any of you remember this. And they had very strict rules about what was allowed in the film and what wasn't. And in a sense, I tried to approach it in a similar way. So I had a kind of, you know, I had a, one chapter had three subchapters. Each subchapter kind of had another subchapter, and so on. So, on. so it was. It, I knew that forced me into a certain rhythm, and it forced me into not overwriting because the book could have been, you know, Speaking three times. Speaking of film, well. does Son of Saul capture uh, a concentration camp? Like yeah, I, I actually um, I, I interviewed the director <laughs> a couple of weeks ago in in London. I think it's an extraordinary film. Um, and uh, he told me that, for whatever reason, kind of the only country it didn't do particularly well in was Germany. Um, 
you can. By the way, KL is concentration camp in, in German. Um, mm. Any. Um, well, I'd like to remind, tips, uh, remind you that. You're not done yet, but. That, yeah, I, I won a, an award for not writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not sure I'm an authority on how to finish one. <laughs> but I, I, I would say that you know, a lot of writers want tips from people like us. And I've read the same stories that you have about I get up in the morning, I do my yoga. <laughs> I write 500 words before breakfast, then I take a walk, and then, you know, I, and I set a, a goal for myself of writing 1,500 words a day, or whatever that total is. I think that's nonsense for most writers. <laughs> sure is. Um, but what, it really, what really bothered me when I wrote my first book was that it sounded like a recipe for daily failure. And nobody wants to fail every day. So for me, um, I'm you know, you use the word maths. I'm, I'm quite mathematical about this. I have 22 chapters in my book. I have to finish by this date. Uh, that means I have to fail once every month. <laughs> I, you know, I set a deadline. I'm going to write one chapter a month, and then I can only fail once a month. Right. But, but That's so very good advice. I mean, you know, it I'm makes gonna, me feel, I'm going to use that on my next It makes me feel book. much better. That's good. Right? That's good. I mean, I'm still trying to get my head around the idea of winning an award for work in progress, which in, in the newsroom that I came from, Work in progress is what you told an editor when he came up to you or she came up to you and said, I've read your lead and it's not very good. And I say, work in progress, work in progress. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the thing is, so many um, people have great ideas for books. I know, Susan, you were a finalist for the work in progress in 2012, I believe it was, when you were I think so, partway through. Sure. And, yeah. and Beth Macy, uh, who, who wrote Factory Man, which is going to be a Tom Hanks movie on HBO, she said she couldn't have finished her, her book without the Work in Progress Award. You were able to finish it, but you got, without us, but you got a lot of help from, from other people. So uh, how did you do that? Uh, how did, I, I noticed in your acknowledgments you, you, you had maybe <laughs> a half, more than a half dozen people who you said supported you in, in some fashion. Did you go out and get grants or? How did you keep I going had support for on so many levels. I had, yeah, I got, I, I got a few grants, um, small. Um, I, um, I hired teams of, once I got the contract with Viking, and I was supposed to finish it in a year, and oh no. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I hired a team of translators to help me with all the interviews. It would have taken me another five or six years to do. I, uh, and... I had my researcher, and I, 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 I borrowed money. I had my, uh, my uh, parents are here. They, they helped me a great deal. I, bar I had to borrow a lot of money from family members and against um, my retirement, which now. Well, that's what the work, that's <laughs> what the work in progress uh, award is about, is to keep people from having to borrow money from their parents. Uh,